Hello, everyone. I hope the microphone has come up. And I would like to, first of all, say thank you. Um, I should have a clicker here. And I'd like to say thank you to quite a number of people. I'd like to say thank you to the college. I'd like to say thank you to Mayor for his very generous and I think possibly um, hyperbolic introduction. <laughs> and to the college for the honor of the invitation of giving this lecture today. I'd also like to th say thank you to the, my colleagues and people with whom I've worked with at Keel. Richard Hayes, who was the head of school when I started, the academic GP team, but most importantly, our GP network, the over 100 practices who teach our students, without whom this story could not be told. I'd also like to say thanks to the SAPSE, the Society for Academic Primary Care Heads of Teaching Group. Jules Rosenthal, who worked with me on that, is here today, and that group has made a lot of what I'm going to talk about possible. And finally, I'd like to thank the woman who's known as Swimbo, she who must be obeyed, <laughs> someone who's put up with my extensive absences over the last 12 years and has been very much a part-time wife. Perhaps that's how she manages to cope with me. <laughs> now, when you come to give a talk like this, there are two terrors. The first terror is that no one is interested enough to turn up. And the second terror is that there are people who are interested enough <laughs> to turn up. Now, the title is a little bit cryptic, but it's taken from a lecture given by Julian Tudor Hart in 1985. This uh, Tudor Hart, I hope, will be known to everyone in the room. He was the author of the Inverse Care Law. He was a GP in Glencorrigan, Wales. And he is one of the grand elder statespeople of British general practice. He was an ardent socialist. He believed in the importance of good health care for all. And in this lecture, he delivered a coruscating critique of undergraduate education in the UK. He started off with the good bits. He said that our schools are reaching a state of asymptotic excellence. They could hardly get any better. However, he felt we were doing the wrong thing. He accused them of creating community physicians as a byproduct and also training the wrong people in the wrong time in the wrong skills and in the wrong place. Apart from that, they were pretty good. <laughs> and he laid down a challenge. He laid out a challenge that medical schools should deliver the majority of the curriculum in primary care. And a, a target, a target reversed the ratio of undergraduate to hospital teaching. Now it's important when looking back so far into history that we have to remember that was a long time ago. In fact, it was a professional lifetime ago. I was just three years post-graduation. I was an SHO in chess medicine, and I was still a year before my first major career decision that I did want to become a GP. It is quite literally a professional lifetime ago. It's also important to remember that the world was a different place. It was a foreign country. If we landed there, we would be very out of place. It was the year of the first uh, Reagan-Gorbachev uh, summit, the process that ended in the dismantling of the Iron, Country, uh, Iron, Iron Curtain and redrew the European map. In the United Kingdom, it was the end of the miners' strike and we just reached peak North Sea oil. Does anybody remember that? It was also a time of tremendous innovation and change. <laughs> we saw the future. We saw the future of transport, the Sinclair C5. And we also saw this strange sort of affectation of mobile phone. This was the first mobile phone sold in the UK. It weighed 11 pounds or five kilograms. It took 10 hours to charge. You got half an hour's talk time. And it cost the equivalent of four and a half thousand pounds in today's money. It was quite obviously a flash in the pan. <laughs> it was also a time of enormous cultural change. We had the first, UK, the first restaurant in the UK with three Michelin stars. We had the start of that cultural icon, EastEnders and the Duff Duffs, and it was the year of Live Aid. And in the profession, it was the year of the Gillick Competences, which have been a part of our life, our work for so long now, but it started that year. And at that time, there were still two UK medical schools that did not have a GP academic on their payroll. A different country. General practice was also a different place. Tudor Hart used this paper by Eric Wilkes, who was the Emeritus Professor of General Practice at uh, Sheffield at the time. 
And his comment on general practice was that for the typical general practitioner, not for them the age sex register, case finding, or high quality surveillance of chronic disease, but just the busy surgery, uh, busy surgery sessions for, for which they felt overtrained, sacrificing quality to speed of throughput. In the context in which they were writing, being overtrained meant spending almost all your education and training in secondary care, you're trained to provide care in secondary care, and suddenly you are dumped into primary care. Since then, we've had a great deal of change. In 1990, we had what my generation called the new contract. That was a period of huge uh, a contract which brought huge change. It brought in incentivization of GP's workload. It brought in, brought in the quaint notion that all patients should have a new patient health check on joining a practice. And it also brought, uh, it paved the way for fund holding. And it brought in an absolutely dreadful innovation about which the, the profession rose as one person to protest against, and that there would be a mandatory retirement age for GP principals. And that was set at the unfeasibly low age of 70. <laughs> Can you imagine forcing doctors to retire at 70? It also brought in payments for undergrad, uh, undergraduate education and general practice at the princely sum of three pounds for, uh, uh, sorry, 12 pounds for a three hour session. That's worth about 26.50 in today's money, a bribe. Since then, we've had more change. In 1995, uh, 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 we had the <coughs> Winyard Report, which established the principle that uh, NH money, NHS money would be available for teaching and general practice on the same boss, uh, uh, basis as hospitals. Of course, it might have been the same basis, but it wasn't a level playing field. The target was the 1997, 2% of the funding would flow into, general, flow into general practice. So you can see the disparity that was built in from the stars. Uh, in 19, uh, sorry, 2004, we had the new, new contract, which made all GPs intimately acquainted with their age sex registers, chronic de disease surveillance, and case finding. It also made us familiar with some other things. And in 2008, uh, Roger Jones, uh, who's in the audience, he reported that at that stage in British medical schools, the average student had 13% 13, 13 of the clinical curriculum in general practice. We all felt things were going pretty swimmingly. Things were going in the right direction. And then in 2015, a bunch of ne'er-do-wells from the HOTS group, Alex Harding and myself being amongst them, published this paper, which rather upset the contentment of the day. We showed, first of all, that the proportion of the curriculum in general practice had stagnated at 13%. It hadn't changed uh, in the previous five years after 40 years of continuing rise. The next slide really did cause consternation. And it shows the amount of time the average student spent in authentic general practice. That is, in general practice, learning from patients rather than being in small groups and taught as in a classroom. It had gone down by 20 sessions, 10 days, two weeks less time in general practice than they had at the turn of the century. This was a sobering datum and it worried a lot of people. We also looked at the funding and we showed that the proportion of funding for uh, taking students in general practice was half of that pro rata that went to hospitals. We had a tentative conclusion, and it's amazing how tentative you are when you do something that upsets people. We suggested that a national re-examination of undergraduate curriculum priorities and associate funding just might, maybe, please, be necessary. However, one of Tudor Hart's accusations was that me medical education produced <coughs> primary care physicians as a byproduct. Surely that has changed. That's no longer the case. However, if you look at the data, it's difficult to draw any other conclusion. This slide shows the proportion in purple, the proportion of doctors who go into training immediately post F2 for the last four years. In 2014, it was 58%. Last year, had it declined to 42%. 60% of our graduates did not go into training post F2. 
The second feature of that slide is that the proportion to go into general practice, the red line, was 28% in 2014. It had fallen to 14% last year. Only one in six of our graduates choose to go into general practice post F2. It's difficult to draw any other conclusion except that general practice careers are still a byproduct, not the product of our education system. I personally think this is the most terrifying slide in the country at the moment. I must not be the only person, there must be others who have done this, but to think that we're losing this proportion of our graduates post that too. Others are worried. The GMC published some data last November going further back and demonstrating that many doctors do indeed come back. In 2014, the last year for which they've got data, about 88% were in training two years later. However, since then, the decline has finished, or has continued, and we still are likely, if this trend continues, to be losing 20 to 25% of our graduates from training. A scary statistic. If, rather than looking at the average, we look at medical schools, individual medical schools, we see some interesting figures. The top line, the top bar, reflects the UK average, the same data for 2017 as you saw on the last slide. Each of the other bars shows a single medical school and the bars in red show the proportion that go into general practice, green, the proportion that go into psychiatry, and in purple, the proportion that go into any other speciality. You see two things. First of all, the huge variation in the proportion between medical schools that go into training. One school, seems to have only 25% last year went into training post F2. The other figure is the six-fold variation between the school that the, had, had the highest proportion, it was Lancaster, went into general practice, and Oxford. It was 29 to, 29% to 9%. This is part of the data, these are the data which have driven the rhetoric, sorry, we'll move on. The, however, you need to be very careful about any league tables drawn on single indicators for single years. This, shows, this slide shows the proportion of students who go into, into GP training post F2 for all UK, UK medical schools over the last four years. One of the things that you'll notice that there are huge variations. Schools go up and down and back up. However, there are schools that are consistently towards the top of the league table and there are those schools which are consistently towards the bottom. This slide shows the top five for GP recruitment. They are Keele, Lancaster, Warwick, Hull York, and Norwich. Norwich has, on average, the lowest of those has ranked five, over the, ranked five in the country over the last four years. There are schools which have ranked consistently towards the bottom. My alma mater, Queen's Belfast, Manchester, Oxford, and UCL. These types of data have uh, 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 driven the rhetoric that it must be about the medical schools and it must be about the general practice content of medical schools. And this was part of the stimulus uh, that led to the commissioning of the VAS report. Val is in the room today. And Val and her team were challenged to explore the factors within medical schools which influence general the choice of general practice as a career. Val produced 15 recommendations, seven of which medical schools were to lead on. We were to get, have, to get more GPs involved with selection. We were to look at the curriculum and explore the complexities of the NHS and the primary secondary care in, uh, interface. We needed more high quality general practice placements. We need more uh, positive general practice role models. We needed to practice, uh, tackle professional undermining and the dissing of general practice and other disciplines, raise the profile of academic primary care, and we should have positive career guidance towards general practice. All of themselves very sensible suggestions, which I wholeheartedly support, but I contend that it partially, at least partially, misses the target. Because I don't believe that the problem can be solved by interventions in medical schools. 
Why do I say that? Well, this is another paper that Hugh Alberti led on, was uh, published by the Heads of Teaching Group. And in this, we looked at the relationship between the proportion of time spent in general practice and the likelihood of a graduate that, of, this, of that school going into general practice post F2. We demonstrated that there was a positive correlation, which was significant, but that correlation is weak. Exposure to general practice is not a strong determinant of whether a doctor will go into general practice. Personally, I wasn't particularly surprised by this. I expected this outcome. And that's because of this paper that Sandra Nicholson, Adrian Hastings and myself published a few years ago, in which we conducted focus groups with students, senior students in six UK medical schools. We were interested in the things that drive their career choices. And what we found was lots of things do. This next graphic is not in the paper. It's a result of a secondary analysis that we did to inform the, uh, another piece of research we were doing at Keel. But these are the things we identified which potentially influence career choices. The things in green are before the student even gets to medical school, their family, their experiences, their own personality. At medical school, many things are active. Whether, whether general practice is seen as a waste of talent or a challenge to talent, either by the school or by the students themselves, and these obviously can attract or repel. Whether the students see the school as a GP factory, and to our surprise, all but one of the six schools students perceive the school to be a GP factory. And that could both attract and repel students depending on their personality. The thing that was really interesting was role models. And the effect of role models is complex. Obviously, negative role models will push people away from anything. But positive roles, role models had a double effect. Some students found it positive, but other uh, students saw their GP role models as doing something magical and inexplicable. The way we could take a patient who came in with a ball of chaos and within two or three minutes could resolve that chaos into something that was ordered and manageable and is something that they personally could not see themselves as doing. We also discovered that one of the things that detracted from general practice was students did not want to be that bad GP. And because the job was seen as impossible, that was a reason not to go into general practice and discard it as a career. So role models are important, but we have to make what we do understandable. So if career and recruitment to general practice is not a reason to have more time in general practice and to move towards Julian Tudor Hart's objective, why should we? Well, he also accused medical schools of training the wrong people in the wrong place. And I passionately agree. David Pearson and I wrote about this in 2010, and in this paper we concluded that clinical education in hospitals fosters an impression that hospitals rescue pa patients from neglect in primary care and surrender them somewhat reluctantly back to secondary care when their care is complete. In reality, the majority of healthcare has always been delivered in primary care in the community. For most, for most patients, continuing care from general practitioners and their colleagues is only rarely interrupted by hospital contacts. And the only way we can inculcate that understanding of that is to actually teach our students in primary care. So if we're going to teach in general practice, what can be achieved? And I'd now like to take you back to 2006, July 2006, when I had my first meaningful conversation with Richard Hayes, who was then uh, an Australian GP, who was then head of school in Kiel. And he asked me a question. He asked, OK, how much of the course can be delivered in general practice in the UK? That then followed possibly the most exciting conversation I've ever had, a conversation which started a process which led me to being appointed to the Kiel next, the following year. And on appointment, I was given the two finest golden hellos that anybody could be given. The first was this, a blank sheet of paper. 
a blank sheet of paper on which I could draw the things that I'd been thinking about for the last 12 years. The second thing was the start of a team and the opportunity to appoint a team of enormously able people. And Janet, Peter, Sheena, Robs, Maggie, Simon and Chantal did much of the work, the legwork, which made what we did possible. They used to tell me that Bob didn't feel stress, but he was a carrier. Everybody around him caught it. <laughs> so what did we do? Well, we first articulated our aim. And me being a sort of very sophisticated highfalutin educationist, you had highfalutin language. And what we envisaged and what we wanted for our graduates was that on the first Wednesday of August, Black Wednesday, one of our graduates would be able to go into a, a room with a patient in the hospital and gather information, would make an, appro an appropriate initial assessment of the patient, would know what needed to be done, would be able to do it, and then hand over to their supervisor. And if all our graduates to do that, could do that, we'd have achieved something incredibly worthwhile and important. This is something which is absolutely embedded in consultation skills and skills of working with patients. These are skills which need a lot of practice, a lot of rehearsal to develop. And we believe that general practice was the place where that could be done. So we drew our curriculum. At that time, years one and two were more or less set in stone. And we drew this. This was our image. The bits in red are general practice. And we built a spiral curriculum on top of years one and two. The first major GP placement would be at the end of year three, after they completed their hospital rotations. We call that, because it says what it does in the tin, the consolidation of clinical skills. Students would have four weeks where they would be free, just see lots of patients and rehearse and practice and consolidate everything that they'd learnt beforehand. In year four, we would build on their basic clinical skills that which they have consolidated and start working on higher consultation skills, the skills of management, or sorry, the skills of diagnosis, management, negotiation with patients, managing information and managing evidence in the consultation. And then, in final year, we would put the capstone on everything by giving students half of their core final year in general practice when they would consolidate everything that they had learnt. So we had 23 weeks of the 94 core clinical weeks with almost a quarter of the clinical curriculum at Keele. Our students, we set targets, we told students what the targets were, we told, told practices what those targets were, and that was that students would lead with 525 consultations across the three years. Huge contact with patients. They would see, they would get a lot of feedback. They would be learning as part of a team rather than isolated individuals that they would have continuity of educational supervision, particularly in final year, that they would feel useful, and most importantly, when they left the practice, they would be missed. Back in 2007, we had a number of reactions. I think it's fair to say that the, the most positive reaction I got from our holiday, uh, uh, hospital colleagues was, it might be okay in a good practice. I was more surprised by the reactions from my GP colleagues. The most common reaction was a smile, and which more or less said, oh, he's off on another one. I also had a, what? You can't do that from a GP colleague. This really was breaking the mold at the time. The GMC, well, they didn't actually have a reaction, but their, their behaviour suggested they thought that what we were doing was interesting. So what happened? Well, we worked very hard and we had the most enormous amount of fun. And we talked about what we did and we wrote about what we did. We knew that we couldn't do it without our rural practices and we had to enable our rural practices to engage in teaching and establishing rural, a, a, a rural campus and looking at what students needed to thrive in a rural campus. We developed instruments to help our GPs assess and give feedback. And we did research on ways of optimising the impact of feedback. 
we tr did a lot of training and we helped uh, practices develop their pre uh, premises. And we were able to demonstrate that we we're actually making changes in the way some of our GPs were practicing as a result of the investment we were making. We thought about quality and how to measure quality. And we thought about how we could improve the quality of the teaching our GPs gave. We started to evaluate. This is a nervous bit. Sometimes it comes up and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, sorry, we described what we're doing. And we started to evaluate what we did. The first evaluation we published was of the rural campus. And then we started looking at the impact of having students learn in a practice for a long period. And we had this wonderful quote where the students described themselves as no longer being knowledge leeches, that their function was to suck learning out of the practice, but because they became part of the team, they were learning within the team and learning from the team and contributing to the team. And we also then we published our final evaluation of the uh, assistantship earlier this year. So what happened? Well, between 2011 and 2016, we had 630 students who went through our final year assistance, assistantship. That involved 80 practices, varying numbers each year, but a large number of practices. The modal number of consultations our students conducted while in general practice in final year was 400 and, uh, 450 consultations, way over the number we asked for. We found that students were competing to see more patients. Not something that happens when students retreat, in most medical schools where students retreat to the library and hit the books. Two thirds of our uh, uh, students reported uh, over 10 episodes of feedback a week. They got enormous amounts of feedback and they were highly satisfied with the learning. And at least 89% in any one year felt that they were useful within the practice and they weren't knowledge leeches. There were buts, however. The first one was unexpected. And we had students who told us that they, their learning reached a plateau after 10 years. After nearly 30 years in practice, I was still learning. But maybe that says more about me than anything else. The second one was something that we were worried about. We did have a continuing narrative that they had spent too long in general practice. And for those who did the rotation second, that they'd been too long out of hospital, especially when going into F1 afterwards. However, it's important to note that we only had 33 comments out of the entire body of feedback that mentioned that, but it was quite a powerful narrative. We were worried about this putting people in general practice for so long before they go into hospital practice. We did our own evaluations, but this is the national data. Every year, the GMC asks foundation doctors how well were they prepared for practice. And this shows the, na the national data since 2012. The thick red line we can just about discern is the mean, and keel is the green line. And that's the green line there. To take them out, and showing the years for which we have keel data, Kiel has always been bound to the average and has never been lower than fifth ranked in the country. Putting doctors or young do uh, medical students in general practice can create enormously well prepared doctors. And that's what we can do. Since then, time has moved on. Oh, sorry. We could say that, uh, of course, our students are deluded that they actually don't realise how well or how badly prepared they are. The one window in this is the work of Claire von Hamel, and she asked foundation school trainers, the supervisors of F1s, how well prepared do uh, uh, doctors were from different medical schools. They, they ra rated their preparedness, and she plotted the average preparedness for any one school against the number of respondents, and was able to draw confidence limits. You see some schools that fall beneath the confidence limits, their doctors are less well prepared than average, and one school that is above. And I'm very happy to report that that school <laughs> is Keele. <coughs> Time moves on, and we now have a new curriculum at Keele, and it's a bit like, a, I think, well, unfortunately, I feel it's a bit like a curate's egg. Um, there are good things, the 
Good thing is that we now have more general practice in years one and two, and we have a longitudinal placement where students will hopefully be placed with the same practice throughout the two years, where they'll get to put into practice the things they learnt in the skills lab. And hopefully we'll give them a head start in developing their clinical skills. The bit that I'm disappointed about, and I have to say I'm disappointed about, is that in the urge to increase the amount of acute care exposure, the amount of general practice has been diminished. It's gone from, 10, from 15 to 10 weeks. I could stop here with this slide and say this was peak general practice, a bit like peak oil all those years ago. But it'd be a bad place to stop. And I'd like to return to Julian Tudor Hart's comment that he thought that medical schools are reaching a, a state of asymptotic excellence. But surely some improvement must be possible. And I think it is in two distinct areas. His first accusation was that we were training the wrong people at the wrong time. Selection to medical school has changed enormously since then and will continue to change. We're now re recruiting against the NS N NHS core values and recruiting, for, uh, re recruiting against these values. And we are increasing diversity of our medical students and we're widening participation. We have not reached the end of that journey, but we're making important steps in that direction. We're also recruiting more graduates. We've got a more mature student body, which I think is a good thing. And this is a major change, which I think will have major imp impacts in the future. The second place where I think there's room for improvement of this is this phenomenon called ethical erosion. You may not have heard of it, but you will recognize it. It's the phenomenon whereby the empathy shown by stu medical students and doctors decline as they progress. It's ubiquitous. It's seen in undergraduate education and postgraduate training, and it's an international phenomenon. If you look for it, you will find it. Why does it happen? Is it the students? And are we recruiting the wrong people? Hopefully that's no longer the case. Do they learn it from the role models? Do they learn it, from learn it from people like me and perhaps some of you? Is it a defense mechanism? Is it a necessary de defense medicine, uh, mechanism that all doctors must develop to protect themselves from the very strange reality that is our job sometimes? Or is it a defense mechanism against a toxic environment because the NHS is not a particularly happy place at the moment? Or is it a function of the curriculum they go rotate through short placements and they never get a chance to build relationships and the relationships are stunted. The relationships with patients and the relationships with their peers and their teachers. Or is it just a function of the toxic environment? There is hope, however, and I'd like to talk about longitudinal integrated clerkships. These are David Hirsch, who is one of the international figures in this area, describes it as turning the curriculum on its side. All people, almost everybody in this room, certainly most of us wearing this gown, will have experienced something that looks like this. And this is a typical year timetable for a senior student, where the student rotates between different disciplines, sometimes extremely rapidly, for the entire year. You've barely arrived, you've barely got to know your, uh, your teachers and the, your colleagues when you move on. You have no chance to build a, a relationship. These can be very beautiful things when you put them together for the entire course. <laughs> and it struck me that this does look rather like Mondrian. <laughs> a longitudinal uh, integrated clerkship is different. In this, students are placed in a single placement for the entire year. This most commonly is in general practice but it doesn't have to be. They spend the entire year in that placement with people that they know, and they step out of it for periods to pick up everything they would have done otherwise in the year. Some things are deemed important, it might be medicine in red, or surgery in yellow, which they do through the entire year. We've all thought that it'd be fantastic if all students had exposure to mental health and pediatrics before general practice. Students can get a bit of paediatrics and mental health if desired at the start of the year and then top up later in the year. And then other disciplines can be fed in 
as needed throughout the year. There's also quite a lot of white space where the students are, can indulge in their own learning. They can go to places where they want to or need to go or to follow patients into hospital and patients back out of hospital to see the continuum of care. These two are quite beautiful when you stack them up with different rotations. And this struck me as being a bit like uh, Broadway Boogie Woogie, one of uh, Mondrian's later paintings, and which I think is a truly beautiful thing. However, they are complicated and they're challenging. They're challenging to students, they're, uh, they're uh, uh, challenging to managers and to teachers. So why bother? What's the point? Well, first of all, they provide for educational continuity. Continuity of placement, tutor and patient. They're student-centred. You can tailor the, you've got much more flexibility to tailor the placements to the student's needs. And because it, uh, the student is in the placement for the entire year, they have a, a supervisor who hopefully they'll trust and can grow with. They're also patient-centred. Students look after a cohort of pa pa patients and review those patients through the year. And theoretically, they should improve learning. There's now a huge international literature. And this was reviewed five years ago by Lucy Walters. And she looked at the literature and looked at student outcomes, outcomes for supervisors, and career outcomes. And what she demonstrated that was that learning did improve. If anything, students who went through longitudinal integrated clerkships did better than their peers on traditional rotations. It improves learning. It reduces ethical erosion. Students who are on LICs, they have a greater sense of vacation, they have a greater sense of patient advocacy, they have a greater self-awareness. It broadens career aims. They're more likely to go into underserved areas and under-recruited disciplines. And it increases stu student and patient satisfaction. Now, if I invited everyone in this room to write down the things that they would like to see happen with medical education in the 2020s, I hope that most of you will have at least some of these outcomes, and LICs have the potential to deliver them. But the last thing that general practice needs right now is more work. Joe and I showed some years ago that at least 12 of the 25 English medical schools were challenged to recruit their GPs. But I think there's untapped potential, and I base this statement on two papers that my, uh, my team and I published in Kiel. In the first paper, we looked at all practices in England and we, we showed that about a third of practices have taken medical students. Another 12% of practices were, in that year were training practices, making a potential total tra uh, training establishment of 45% of practices. We have the potential, I believe, to increase our establishment of training, teaching practices by about a third. This can be done. In Staffordshire and Shropshire, our hunting ground, we now have 45% of practices teaching our undergraduates. And that's not because we're particularly privileged, that general practice is not particularly good. Stoke is one of the most deprived cities in the United Kingdom. And when I went to Stoke in 2007, a third of practices were single-handed. It can be, if we can do it in Shropshire and Staffordshire, I think it can be done anywhere. So where is this spare capacity? The second paper published a heat map of teaching in the UK. The red shows the postcode sectors where more practices teach, and the blue, the sectors where fewer practices teach. If you look at the southern half of the country, you will see there are places that are in dark blue, and in those places, fewer than 10% of practices teach. The next level of blue, which is hard to see, between 10 and 30% of practices teach. I believe there's capacity out there. We need to reach it. I think the way to do this is to make teaching easier to do, make it attainable for practices. Lucy Walter showed that LICs are actually have a less of a burden in practices than conventional placements. You also, we also need to build on the natural strengths of general practice, something we described when we talked about our curriculum first, and to build on practices creativity. Don't tell them how to do it, tell them what you want to do, 
but let them decide how themselves. Let them build relationships, <coughs> let them work in the continuity, and this is something very special that general practice can deliver. More recently, we've had an interesting signal from a paper that's yet to be published, but I'm doing with uh, Sophie Parks and Hugh Alberti. And that was showing that the curriculum matters. GP teachers prefer to teach when they're asked to provide longitudinal places. Longer placements are preferable. GPs engage and to give them short placements tends to drive them away from teaching. We also showed there's an untapped pool of teachers amongst locums and salary doctors, which could be interesting to try and access. But we have challenges. The mapping study showed that the mean difference at that time, distance at that time between a medical, I'm sorry, a practice and its medical school was 28 kilometers. If we use more practices, we are going to have, need to think about ways of enabling distant practices to teach, as we've done at Keele. We also need to address funding. There's gross inequity of educational funding. The funding from medical schools to their practices, teaching practices, averages £600 in England. I don't have the data for the rest of the United Kingdom. But there is a considerable range, an almost fourfold range amongst what medical schools pay. The lowest is £220 a week, the highest £860. But compare that against the teaching and the funding for hospital teaching, currently £920. A few years ago, Alex Harding, Joe and I published this paper which caused consternation. And one of the sources of the consternation was that we made the outrageous claim that the cost of teaching to general practices was about £1,000 a week. This was grossly overinflated, uh, uh, over and we were showboating and obviously over-egging the pudding. Joe and John Campbell and I, in conjunction with the Department of Health and Health Education England, have just costed education in English general practice. We had, we had practices from every medical school, and the data have been accepted by the Department of Health and Health Education, England, that undergraduate education and general practice is significantly underfunded. I don't quite feel able at the moment to release the figure, but it's now accepted that it's underfunded. And the whole challenge now will be to get the political change that we need. However, the NHS is different. It's okay all this data from North America and Australia, and it never happened in the UK. Well, this month in the College Journal, Maggie Bartlett and Francis Muir published this editorial describing the growth of LICs in the UK. Maggie is going live with Scott Jam with an LIC for their students in the Highlands and Islands and in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, in Galloway. And it's not just something that can be done in the peripheries. Sonia Kumar at Imperial is about to go live with an LIC in London. It's something which can be done in the UK, and it's something which I think we need to do. So I'd like to leave you, not with my title, but an ambition of, let's flip the world on its side, because that's the future of undergraduate education in general practice. My last slide is a comment that I was given by one of our students one of our students on her final year general practice placement. And this encapsulates so much of what was wrong about undergraduate education and so much of what general practice can do right. It's simple, but it's pungent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>